We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we worship your glory, eternal three in one, and we praise your power, majestic one in three author of creation, eternal word of salvation, life-giving spirit of wisdom, keep us steadfast in the faith. Defend us in all adversity and bring us at last into your presence where you live in endless joy and love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Welcome to this Sunday of Holy Trinity as we reflect on the God whom we worship and ask God's help that we might grow in our love for our triune God. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. 
Each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces, and with two, they covered their feet, and with two, they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. Word of God, word of life. reading from Romans. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. 
Word of God, Word of Life. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Judeans, and he came to Jesus by night and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive 
our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. This Sunday, in a concentrated way, the church reflects upon the source of all things, the one we worship, the one in whose name and into whose life we have been baptized. Baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit born again through water and the Spirit, baptized into one God in three hypostases or realities or persons, a God not possessing love as an attribute, but being love itself. This God, not a riddle for us to solve, but a lover whom we love only because he first loved us. All our creeds, our symbols, our analogies, they exist not to help us perform a conceptual autopsy, but to draw us ever deeper into the divine mystery. Thus, our language about God consists of sacred signposts that only imperfectly point to the reality beyond. They are necessary so that we do not remain altogether silent, but they are at best provisional, inadequate, insufficient before the glorious mystery of our triune God. In keeping with today's focus on the Holy Trinity, in a few minutes we're going to begin responsively confessing our faith using the words of the Athanasian Creed one of the three creeds affirmed by Lutherans and used in churches in the West for nearly 1,500 years. By way of warning, I will just note that the language of the Athanasian Creed can sound stilted. The lessons repetitive and maybe a bit abstract, even some of the statements will sound a bit harsh to us. It might feel like we are memorizing vocabulary or rules of grammar, but I would encourage us to hear this creed, to receive its message less as an explanation than an invitation. Instead of laying bare the inner workings of our Christian language about God, this sacred confession aims to form our imaginations so that we might enter more fully and joyously into the deepest mystery of our faith. Which means this creed is less a statement of belief than a humble petition and a prayer that in knowing our God a little better, we might come to love him a little bit more. One God in three persons, blessed Trinity.
we begin with the first part. Whoever wants to be saved should above all cling to the Catholic faith. Whoever does not guard it whole and inviolable will doubtless perish eternally. Now this is the Catholic faith. We worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the divine being. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Holy Spirit is still another. But the deity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory, co-eternal in majesty. What the Father is, the Son is, and so is the Holy Spirit. Uncreated is the Father, Uncreated is the Son, uncreated is the Spirit. The Father is infinite, the Son is infinite, the Holy Spirit is infinite. Eternal is the Father, eternal is the Son, eternal is the Holy Spirit. And yet there are not three eternal beings, but one who is eternal. Just as there are not three uncreated and unlimited beings, but one who is uncreated and unlimited. In the same way, the Father is almighty, the Son is almighty, and the Holy Spirit is almighty. And yet there are not three almighty beings, but one who is almighty. Thus the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And yet there are not three gods, but one God. Thus the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, and the Holy Spirit is Lord. And yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. It's a strange thing, Bethlehem, how often we speak of God, how often in worship we admonish one another to love, to trust, to praise, and to pray to God. And yet how difficult to grasp this little word that we use so often. To the detached observer that there is a God may be a question open to debate. Or granting God's existence, a philosopher may wonder, at what manner of thing God is. For the believer, however, God is no thing. In fact, the true lover of God is indifferent to the what, because so utterly preoccupied with the who. Take my mother as an example. I love her, not for the particular kind of thing she is, but for who she is to me and for me and for our family. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit then isn't just a proper noun or a divine self-identification, but it's an expression of a threefold unity that is at once transcendent and deeply personal. Which is why in our prayer and in our praise, we address ourselves not to whomever it may concern, but to the living God, who is not so much constituted by three distinct personalities as he is the sheer act of relationality itself. Thus, we can speak of God as being for, being from, and being with. God is being for in the way a parent gives to her child without wanting or expecting anything for herself. And God is being from in the way that a child proceeds from her mother. And God is being with in the way that each member of a family ought to support and nurture every other member. In this way, we worship the Holy Trinity, one God disposed in three ways. 
God the Father being for God the Son. God the Son being from God the Father. And God the Holy Spirit being with the Father and the Son and being with us. Let us continue our confession. As the Christian truth compels us to acknowledge each distinct person as God and Lord, so Catholic religion forbids us to say that there are three gods or lords. The Father was neither made nor created nor begotten. The Son was neither made nor created but was alone begotten of the Father. The Holy Spirit was neither made nor created, but is proceeding from the Father and the Son. Thus there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three spirits. And in this Trinity, no one is before or after, greater or less than the other. But all three persons are in themselves co-eternal and co-equal. And so we must worship the Trinity in unity and the one God in three persons. Whoever wants to be saved should think thus about the Trinity. There is an ancient pagan image, Bethlehem, of three virgin goddesses called the Graces, human representations of the feminine nouns gratia in the Latin or charis in the Greek, both words that mean grace. And in popular depictions in the first century, the three Graces are often shown dancing unclothed in the woods. Well, the Roman philosopher Seneca was once asked about these popular images. He was asked about what these three graces represented. And he explained that they stood for the social obligations of giving, receiving, and returning gifts. He said the graces were holding hands while dancing to express unity, harmony, perfect reciprocity, the completeness of exchange. Each grace at one point in the dance standing in the position of the other, each enjoying one another's favor. He further explained that <clears throat> these graces were young women because a gift should not grow old, not be forgotten, but it should go on provoking a response of gratitude. He said that the graces were depicted unclothed or wearing transparent attire in accord with the Roman expression, naked are the graces, meaning that true exchange should be guileless. Givers ought to give without hidden intentions. Receivers ought to be open-hearted and the gifts ought to be transferred discreetly. In her book, The Gift of Thanks, Margaret Visser reflects on the beauty of this ancient image, how the graces do not restrict the flow of gifts, but are constantly passing them on, each disposed toward sharing with the others. Three figures, alike in dignity, united in purpose, embodying the threefold grace of giving receiving and returning. Perhaps you hear in this description of the Roman graces an echo 
of the Christian vision of the Holy Trinity. An eternal Father whose love begets a Son. An eternal Son who returns that love to the Father. And an eternal Spirit who is, in fact, that reciprocal love of Father for Son, of Son for Father. And the good news which Christians celebrate every time we name our triune God is that this love which God is, it's the very same love poured into our hearts when we were baptized in the name and into the relationship that coheres in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, it's true, we are speaking only by way of analogy, of course. But this picture of the three dancing graces gives poetic expression to the formal language of the Athanasian Creed. In fact, the Greek word for Trinity, beloved of our Orthodox brethren, is perichoresis, meaning rotation, a circling without beginning or end. Or, as it's more often translated, a dance. The Holy Trinity as eternal dance, expressing the love, the joy, the unity at the very heart of existence. The lover, the beloved, and the love that they reciprocate. The giver, the receiver, and the shared gift. God for, God from, and God with. Let us continue with the last part of our confession. It is necessary for eternal salvation that one also faithfully believe that our Lord Jesus Christ became flesh. For this is the true faith that we believe and confess, that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at the same time both God and man. He is God begotten before all worlds from the being of the Father. And he is man, born in the world from the being of his mother, existing fully as man with a rational soul and a human body. Equal to the Father in divinity, subordinate to the Father in humanity. Although he is God and man, he is not divided, but is one Christ. He is united because he has taken humanity into himself. He does not transform deity into humanity. He is completely one in the unity of his person without confusing his natures, For as the rational soul and body are one person, so the one Christ is God and man. He suffered death for our salvation. He descended into hell and rose again the third day from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty. He will come again to judge the living and the dead, and at his coming all people shall rise bodily to give an account of their deeds. And those who have done good will enter eternal life, and those who have done evil into eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith. One cannot be saved without believing this firmly and faithfully. 
These are hard words for us to hear, Bethlehem. And as Lutherans, we hear them and receive them in a particular way, recognizing that when we speak of the good works done, we recognize that they are not what merit our salvation, but rather they are an outworking of God's salvific work in our lives. And so we hold this in tension as we pivot this morning and ask ourselves a very simple question. How has our thinking about God changed today as we've heard this creed or maybe throughout our lives? When I was a child, St. Paul says, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I set aside childish ways. How many of us have seen our image of God change over the years? For some of us, that earliest image of God was of an old man with a white beard living up in the clouds, punishing our bad behavior, rewarding our good. For others, God was a sort of superhuman uh, with, instead of a red cape, it was a red sash across his midsection, and he lived long ago and got himself killed, but somehow came back to life. I hope that there is more to our knowledge of God than these flawed pictures with which we perhaps began the life of faith. But just like our artistic skills can get stuck in the limbo of arrested development and we continue to draw stick figures when we mean to represent the fullness of humans interacting with their environment, so too can our all too human conceptions of God in many ways stall. The Athanasian Creed then serves as a kind of corrective. To use the mystical language of Father Richard Rohr, it doesn't so much teach us what to see as how to see. And that brings us back to the heart of the matter. For the true aim of Trinity Sunday is not to explain God, but to worship him, to encounter him anew, and to find ourselves in him. The one in whose image and likeness we were made. Because to know God rightly is to know ourselves truly. And the truth is, our being made in the image of God suggests that we were made for fellowship, for communion, being for, being from, and being with. In many ways, we are like a baby in utero, trying to understand our mother from inside. We may not know what the manner of thing this is. But as a fetus, we know our mother with a knowledge far more intuitive and personal and intimate than we could ever apprehend intellectually. We know our mother through the gifts that we receive and maybe through the sound of her voice. This notion is analogous to St. Paul's assertion that we are in God. That's what the Apostle is expressing when he quotes the Roman poets and pagan philosophers of his day standing before that temple to the unknown God on the Acropolis in Athens. In him, that is in God, we live and move and have our being. St. Paul declares, for we are his offspring. This is the same idea that St. Augustine proposes when he affirms that God is closer to us than we are to ourselves. Notice, St. Paul and St. Augustine aren't so much telling us what to see, but how to see. What the church calls spiritual insight or mystical vision. In the end, our language, our metaphors, our pictures all fall short of the glory of God. And maybe that's the point. They come up short so that we cannot mistake them 
for God. We cannot hide behind them, but must finally bend the knee in awe or stand in reverence before the mystery that was hidden for ages but is now revealed. God as Father, God as Son, God as Holy Spirit. Before this one God in three persons, we make bold to join our voices with all the saints and the angels and the archangels in heaven, crying, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you.
Let us pray. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you, be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve our triune Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.